Hello and welcome to Matt Parker's Maths Solutions. I'm Matt Parker and the solution this time is for the 10th of Matt Parker's Maths Puzzles and this one is the avoid the square problem. As you may have noticed we're going picture in picture for this solution video. Not only that but I can drive my little, uh, there's me, I can drive myself around the screen which is, I'll be honest, an outrageous amount of fun. So I'm going to put myself here, I can go here, is that, there we are, avoid the square. Now I called it avoid the square, but that's not the original name for this puzzle. It's actually traditionally known as the game of hip. And it was Martin Gardner who came up with this decades ago. And they called it the game of hip because uh, hipsters at the time famously avoided squares. It was very trendy back in probably the 1950s. So back in the past, that was a very funny name. But I knew both, if I called it that, it's gonna require a lot of explanation and people would just Google it and get the answer. And that's not very, that's not fun. That's not the point of Matt Parker's mass power it just appears in the little window with me. That's interesting. Um, so anyway, so I changed the name to avoid the square, but if you wanna Google it and find more, uh, look up Martin Gardner and the game of hip and you can find more information. But okay, let's get into the solutions people sent in. So first of all, we had 2,387 valid, let me go over there and just look at, that, that many, we had that many valid entries. Well done, everyone. Uh, that's when we took out the duplicates. Surprising number of duplicates this time. And uh, of those, 827 were correct. So 35% bit lower than normal, I think, but it was a reasonably difficult challenge. But well done, uh, people who uh, got that correct. That's, uh, that's amazing. And of course, there are participation points for everyone else. If you gave it a go, but you didn't get it perfectly correct, Still got you, because giving it a go is half the challenge. Now I asked Oliver, who does all the analyzing of the entries, uh, to give me some breakdown stats, and they found all the squares that people didn't notice they had. And so they give me the breakdown, and uh, they give them names. I asked uh, what they mean, and this, this is the diagram that they sent in. So these are all the, I think I can go there, I'm out of the way. These are all the, um, oh sorry, they're over there, they're over there, sorry. These are all the bits that uh, Oliver gave names to all of these. So you've got the axis aligned ones, you've got the 45 degree ones. Uh, the windmills are kind of cool. So this is the uh, semi, that way, that way. That's the semi uh, right windmill. I'm used to being on the other side of the screen. Uh, the large right windmill. And this is, these name them the directions that you could imagine that they're, they're turning. Um, if they were a square that got excited, got a bit hip and moved to the side. And so we had 824 axis aligned squares sent in by accident. We had 124 of these 45 degree ones. So 124 of those in by accident, 571 small left windmills, 307 small right windmills, 73 large left ones and 57 large right. So uh, these ones here, the large rights, they're the rarest ones that people put in by accident. Huh, weird. But then again, uh, we have lumped all of the uh, access aligned ones over there in the opposite corner. They're all um, lumped together. So there you go. Now there were 2,704 valid um, solutions people could have sent in and several people found all of them. So good job, Ben Hayden found all 2,704. Now that's not taking out ones that are symmetric or rotated. So there are solutions which we would say are equivalent to each other. And if you narrow it down to just uh, the individual ones, oh, this is um, Ben's spreadsheet of all of them. Wow, look at them go. Uh, if you narrow it down, oh, sorry, Jay, I'm in front of your name. Uh, there we go. If you just go for the ones, like you take out all the duplicates, there are all 340 of these here that Jay has done. So good work, Jay, for sending those all in. Nice diagram. Big fan of a good diagram. Of course, we've got loads of spreadsheets. Matthew put in a spreadsheet where if you, it tells you what type of square you have formed when you put your counters on the board. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, and it's a, a Matthew often sends in spreadsheets. This one looked particularly good. They said they worked with their girlfriend, Alan to make the spreadsheet look nicer than normal. So there you are. Uh, An honorable mention, uh, Simon Shea also sent in a fantastic spreadsheet. 
um, I'll link to uh, everything that if people have shared it publicly, I'll, there'll link, be links to all of this in the description below. Chris here uh, wrote, oops, I was going to cover that up. Uh, Chris here wrote a bit of Java. And so it's a little widget that can check possible solutions. I'll link to that. This is, there is a link to this. I'll put it in the description below. And uh, if, if you create a square, which can't be avoided, then the bit of the square that, uh, need, that uh, can't be avoided is colored in black. So there you are. But anyway, you can check out Chris's uh, widget. I'll link to it below. Not everyone went digital. Of course, we always have some analog solutions. So TJ here made a series of cutout masks that you could put over the coins to, to check. Oh, that's, you know, that's moving around too much for me. I'm going to pause. Okay, we get it, we get it, we get it. You move the mask around and you find them. So uh, TJ sent in a lot of images, thanks TJ, uh, showing how you can move these uh, cutouts around and uh, they've made them so they can quickly check for squares. Very nice, I like that. Good analog solution. Loads of code came in. So uh, here we go. This is the Julia uh, code and... Um, oh, this one was interesting because while Clinton missed a few squares, they were doing it in an unusual way. They were converting the boards into a binary number. So if you've seen a previous video on my main channel I did with Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown fame, where you have heads or tails on a board and then you can turn that into a binary number, that is um, what Clinton did coding this up. And so it was very clever code. I love what they were doing. Um, Definitely worth a mention. Uh, Danielle, they did some Python code, which was lovely. So they get the Python mention this time around. And Harry, did Maple, uh, and what did they phrase that? Hang on, let me bring up Harry's email here. Uh, they said, um, blah, 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 blah. He, the off-neglected Maple. So Harry thought it might be nice to uh, get some Maple involved for a change. So there you are. Good work, Harry. So actually, no, I'm going to go over the side. There we are. Harry, good work. Um, and so uh, someone used R. So, uh... L Wait, hang on. That's um, pronounced. That's look uh, look at that person. That person. Good on you. That person. They used R to find all the solutions. And as you can see now, they are doing it for different sized grids. Spoiler alert. Um, and what are those numbers? They got a total of fifty six on the six by six. They must be cancelling them out in other ways. But anyway, R code. Love what you're doing. Now, that's a little hint because, of course, people were looking at other size boards. So the question now is, uh, what about solutions for uh, different size boards? And loads of people looked into this. Um, Mosh... Uh, hang on, let me go over this way. Moshe, this person, good on you, this person, with, let's not forget, a surname. Uh, they uh, looked at solutions for different colored boards and sent in some fantastic diagrams and a non-comprehensive list for um, all the way up to six by six, but they correctly noticed there are no solutions for seven by seven. So we said five by five because six by six, there are some solutions, but my goodness, it gets difficult to find the six by sixes. And so actually, was that what we had before? Sorry. Ah, uh, that's why, sorry, I was looking at six by six. Uh, I don't think they've cancelled out a bunch of the options on that one. Sorry. I keep forgetting because I was torn between setting 6x6 and 5x5 as a submittable puzzle. 6x6, way more difficult. Uh, but 5x5 is a bit more straightforward. Still still hard, but well done everyone who did that. Uh, so here we go. The, the, the 7x7 can't be done. Impossible. Uh, not the only person who worked that out. So uh, Turo here, they uh, went through and they did a whole bunch of uh, different grid sizes. They got down. I forget how they were cancelling them out. There are fewer than 24 for 6x6, six six, but they must have kept duplicates in. However, they're doing the counting. It's, you know, if you want to count them, it's your decision how you want to cross out and what you consider to be a duplicate. But then they found, uh, rightfully, that there are no 7x7s. Seven and actually, you can stop there. So they, as a challenge, kept running their code for bigger ones. But if there are no 7x7s, seven then once you get to an 8x8 eight eight grid, it's got to have a 7x7 seven seven in the corner. So it, it, it contains a 7x7. Seven seven, and in order for there to be a possible 8x8 eight eight with no squares, it needs to be able to have not only, well, they need to be overlapping because there's multiple you can fit four different seven by sevens in there and so but they all have to be with no squares within them so in the moment there are none at one you're not going to get them for any bigger boards um, but people still kept processing it why not 
for completeness. People extended it in different ways, and so uh, Zhu and Aloy Sus Ning, uh, they gave it a go. They're um, uh, high school students, secondary school students in Singapore. Could work, folks. Let me get out of the way. Here we go. So they, um, okay, I'll explain, I'll explain what they've done here. So they looked at different ways to generalize it, looked at having different colors, different sizes, and they looked at rectangles. And so they found uh, no solutions for a six by seven and some bigger ones. And then they kept finding loads of solutions for five by somethings. And they went, hang on, is there a solution for every five by five for all ends? And they checked and they, they managed to prove there are no, uh, you can always have a draw, there are no cases where you can't solve it for five by something. And part of their proof was uh, what you can see above me here. This is a five by 13 grid and this can repeat. And so they were able to show you can have any length because you can build it up with smaller ones. And part of that was this repeating five by 13 pattern. Good work, folks. Love what you're doing. Uh, final two mentions. Of course, some people did go analog. Alistair here, uh, you don't need a fancy computer. They uh, did a whole bunch of, they wrote it all out and did it by hand. Very clever, love what you're doing. And finally, Lego. Andreas solved it using bits of Lego. And I got a note here from Deanna. So uh, Deanna helps me go through all the stuff people send in. We pick our favorite ones, put it together in the slideshow. Deanna made a note. Uh, anyone who uses Lego to attempt a puzzle should get a bonus point right. No, you'll get an honorable mention, no bonus points. But hey, Lego, maybe. I don't think so, but you know what? I will take it into consideration to give a bonus point for use of Lego. Hmm, maybe. I can't, I can't guarantee we're gonna do that. So anyway, uh, that's everyone. So I can, um, oh, where'd I go? Oh no! And here I come back, ah, full screen. I got my switcher here again, I'm, I'm having uh, too much fun with that. So anyway, thank you so much everyone who entered uh, this round. I think we're going to be back next week with another puzzle. People seem to enjoy them. We'll try and keep doing them. Thank you so much for taking part. It's an absolute honor to go through all the fantastic mathematics you send in. See you next time.